everyone. I'm back to read the next American Girl doll book. Uh, we're reading Marie Grace and Cecile these days. And um, today I'm going to read book three called Marie Grace and the Orphans from 1853. And here we have Marie Grace in her cute little blue dress. Anyway, I'll go ahead and read the back of the book so we can see what this one is about. It says, Marie Grace can't believe what she finds on her doorstep one rainy night, a baby. More than anything, Marie Grace hopes her father will let the little boy stay with them. But when a slave catcher comes looking for him, Marie Grace realizes the baby is in terrible danger. Together, she and her friend Cecile come up with a way to keep the child safe. Just when Marie Grace thinks their plan will work, Rumors of a deadly fever begin to swirl through New Orleans. Soon Marie Grace wonders if anyone will be safe. Okay, so that's what this book is about. And we'll go ahead and get started. Hope you guys like it. All right, Marie Grace and the Orphans. And we will find out first what our characters are in this book. We have Papa, Marie Grace's father, a dedicated doctor who is serious but kind, Marie Grace, a shy, caring girl who is happy to be back in New Orleans, Mrs. Curtis, a no-nonsense widow who has been the gardener's housekeeper for four years, Uncle Luke, Marie Grace's uncle who is a Mississippi River steamboat pilot, we have Argos, Marie Grace's dog, who is her constant companion. Mademoiselle Oceane, a French opera singer who gives voice lessons. Cecile Ray, a confident girl who is Marie Grace's first real friend. Lavinia, a wealthy girl who likes to be the boss. And Sister Beatrice, a warm and wise nun who is in charge at Holy Trinity Orphanage. Okay, those are our characters. And chapter one is called A Knock at the Door. May 1853. As Marie Grace Gardner copied out her French lesson, light from the oil lamp glimmered off the glass medicine bottles in her father's office. The room was quiet. Even though it was late, her father, Dr. Taddeus Gardner, was still out seeing patients. Marie Grace could have could hardly wait for Papa to return so that she could tell him her good news. A girl named Isabel had joined her class today. Marie Grace was usually shy, but she knew how hard it was to be the new girl in school, so she had worked up the courage and talked to Isabel. The two of them had sat together at lunch, and Marie Grace had been delighted to discover that Isabel was quite friendly. So far, Marie Grace's only true friend in New Orleans was Cecile Ray, but Cecile and Marie Grace did not go to school together. They usually only saw each other on Saturdays when they, um, when they both took singing lessons at the Royal Music Hall. It would be nice to have a friend at school, thought Marie Grace, smiling. Maybe Isabel and I could play together after classes. As Marie Grace dipped her pen in the inkwell, she remembered that she had bad news to share with her father, too. During supper, their new maid, Annie, had argued with their housekeeper, Mrs. Curtis, and Annie had announced that she was quitting, and she'd left before the dishes were washed. Mrs. Curtis had gone to bed early with a headache. Now Marie Grace was the only one in the household who was awake. As she struggled with her French verbs, she listened for the sound of her father's key in the lock. But besides the scratching of her steel pen on the paper, all Marie Grace could hear was the clock ticking and the rain gently tapping on the front window. Suddenly a loud knock broke the silence. Marie Grace was so startled that her hand jumped, leaving a heart-shaped ink spill on her page. Her dog Argos raced to the door barking. Marie Grace knew that she should not unlock the door at night. If anyone came to the office after dark, Annie or Mrs. Curtis was supposed to answer the door. But Annie was gone and Mrs. Curtis was asleep. So Marie Grace blotted the ink stain and hoped that whoever was at the door would go away. Then another knock sounded. 
even louder than the first. Marie Grace guessed that the visitor could see the lamplight and thought that Dr. Gardner was in his office. The office is closed, she called above Argos's barking. Then she repeated in French, Le bureau est fermé. A woman's muffled voice came, made a sharp, a short reply. It sounded like, please take. Marie Grace could not understand the last few words. After a few moments, Argo stopped barking, but he stood at the door whimpering. Marie Grace went to the front window and peeked around the curtains. The steel lamp on the corner cast a dim light. Marie Grace could see that the woman had gone away, but she had left a basket on the step. What's that? That's what Argos is excited about, Marie Grace realized. Her father often took care of people who had no money, and sometimes they left food as payment. Grateful patients brought fresh fish or jars of homemade pickles and preserves. One farmer had even delivered a large smoked ham. Argos whined impatiently. All right, Marie Grace whispered, we'll see what it is. She opened the door and a light rain was falling and the air smelled like the muddy le levees along the Mississippi River. Holding tight to Argos's collar, Marie Grace leaned down to look at the basket. There was a lump of something inside, but it was covered by a cloth. Curious, Marie Grace pushed aside the cloth. Then she gasped. She let go of Ar Argos's collar and picked up the basket. When she carefully lifted the cloth and looked again, there could be no mistake. A sleeping baby lay nestled inside the basket. Gracious sakes, breathed Marie Grace as she stared at the child. She looked up and down the street. At first, she didn't see anyone. Then she caught a glimpse of movement at the end of the block. A slender woman with a cloth tied around her head was standing half, half hiding by a building. Madam, Marie Grace called, is this your baby? Instead of answering, the woman disappeared around the corner. A fresh breeze blew down the street, bringing with it a sprinkling of rain. The baby shuddered and gave a soft cry in its sleep. Argos looked up at Marie Grace questioningly. Marie Grace knew what she had to do. She carried the basket into her father's office and carefully set it on the desk. By the light of the lamp oil, she saw that damp ringlets of hair framed the baby's face. The child held its tiny fist to its mouth and its eyes were scrunched closed. Hello, she whispered to the sleeping infant. You didn't get rained on, did you? The baby was wearing a patched gown that looked as if it had made, been made from an old flour sack. Marie Grace touched the cloth and the baby woke. The child's blue-gray eyes looked at her anxiously, a thin line forming between the delicately arched eyebrows. Don't cry, Marie Grace said, gently stroking the baby's cheek. As she leaned over the basket, she sniffed something that smelled like coconut. You'll be all right now. My papa will be home soon. And a stern voice interrupted her. Marie Grace, why is the door open? It was her father. She had not even heard him come into the office. As, she, as, she, as he took off his overcoat and hat, he began to lecture her. I've told you a thousand times that you must that you must keep the office locked when you're alone here at night. A woman knocked on the door, Papa, Marie Grace explained. She went away, but look what she left. Marie Grace stepped aside so that her father could see the basket. Who's this? He asked, his voice softening. Marie Grace explained how she had found the child. The woman the woman was standing on the corner watching when I picked up the basket, but she ran away when I called to her. I'll see if anyone's out there now, her father said. He hurried out the door, not even stopping to put on his hat and coat. The baby began to whimper. Marie Grace gently rocked the basket until her father returned a few minutes later. His hair was wet from the rain. There's no one on the street, he reported. The woman must have stayed just long enough to make sure you brought the baby inside. Why would she do that? Asked Marie Grace, looking down at the tiny baby. 
Once in Pennsylvania, a man left a baby on the doorstep, said Dr. Gardner, wiping his glasses with a towel. The mother had died, and since I'm a doctor, the man thought the baby would be safe with me. I've heard of similar things happening to doctors here in New Orleans, too. Dr. Gardner put the towel over his shoulder, and then he took the baby out of the basket. The woman, who was on the corner, have you seen her before? Marie Grace bit her lip, trying to remember what the woman had looked like. I don't think so, she said at last. But it was dark, and all I could tell was that she was thin. Marie Grace thought for a moment. She had a kerchief around her head, too, like the ones the women in the market wear. Her father began to undress the baby, and suddenly Marie Grace smelled something that wasn't coconut at all. Her father sighed. We need to change him. Would you get me a few more towels? Marie Grace ran upstairs. When she, retur when she returned with an armful of towels, the baby was wailing pitifully. Her father wrapped the child in clean linen, and then he started mixing something in one of his medicine beakers. What's wrong, Marie Grace asked anxiously. Is the baby sick? No, he's just hungry, said her father. He's a few weeks old and looks healthy, but he's thin. I'm mixing some sugar and water to tide him over for now. Then I'll ask Mrs. Lambert if she'll nurse him along with her own baby. Marie Grace nodded. Mrs. Lambert was a cheerful woman who lived next nearby. She had a large family, and she earned money by cleaning and doing laundry for neighbors. Mrs. Lambert wouldn't mind taking care of one more baby, Marie Grace thought. Dr. Gardner dipped his finger into the water and then touched the baby's lip with his moistened finger. The, boy be, the, baby, sorry, the child stopped crying and sucked eagerly at the sugar water. He is hungry, Marie Grace exclaimed. How could his mother leave him like that? Whoever the mother was, I'll wager she didn't want to leave him, said Dr. Gardner as he dipped his finger into the water again. Desperate times call for de desperate measures. What does that mean, Marie Grace asked. It means that sometimes you have to do very hard things even though you don't want to. His mother or somebody tried to take care of him. He has a rash, but someone put a salve made with coconut oil on it, and whoever left him on the doorstep made sure that he was brought inside. Marie Grace was puzzled. But why did she give him up? I guess, my guess is that his mother loved him very much. She may have died like the mother in Pennsylvania did, or the baby's mother might be alive, but in terrible circumstances. She may have given him up so that he could have a better life, said Dr. Gardner, as the baby continued to suck happily at his finger. Papa explained that women of color in New Orleans often wear kerchiefs around their heads. So the woman Marie Grace had seen was either a free person of color or a slave. If the baby's mother was a slave, she may have taken this desperate measure to keep her child from growing up in slavery. Slavery, thought Marie Grace, and she felt a chill go up her spine. The baby's skin was about the same color as her own, but in New Orleans, there were so many different shades of skin color that it was sometimes hard to tell who was white and who was a person of color. Marie Grace knew that many people of color in the city were free, including her friend Cecile. Cecile's father owned his own business, and Cecile lived in an elegant home and dressed in the latest fashions. She had a private tutor and a maid accompanied her to music lessons. But Marie Grace also knew that many people of color were slaves. They labored long hours without pay, and they could be sold to someone else at any time. It would be terrible to be a slave, Marie Grace said, gazing down at the baby. We don't know that his mother was a slave, her father cautioned. We don't even know that she, uh, that she was a person of color. The woman who left him here might have been a family friend or servant. We may never know who the child's parents are. Just then the baby stopped sucking and started to cry again. But we do know that he's not, that he's not happy, Dr. Gardner said. He held the baby against his, 
shoulder and walked him around the office. The child cried even louder. As Marie Grace watched her father pace the room, she recalled how he used to walk Daniel, her baby brother, in just the same way. She felt a twist in her stomach as she thought about her mother and brother, who had both died in a cholera epidemic more than four years ago. She remembered listening to the lullabies her mother sang to Daniel and hearing the thud of her father's footsteps in the hall as he walked Daniel for many hours at a time. May I try? Marie Grace asked her father. He nodded and gently handed her the wailing infant. Face dodo mon infant, Marie Grace sang. Go to sleep, my baby. She gently patted the baby on the back, the way she remembered her mother soothing Daniel. The baby sobs quieted. Then he nestled into her shoulder and closed his eyes. Good work, her father said. He lifted the slipping, sleeping baby out of her arms and tucked him back into the basket, covering him with a clean towel. Asleep, the baby looked like a perfect angel. Oh, please, Papa, can he stay here with us? Marie Grace whispered to her father. No, indeed, he said. A baby needs a great deal of care, and we've lots to do already, don't we? She nodded reluctantly. She knew Papa was busy. After her mother and Daniel had died, Marie Grace and her father had left New Orleans and lived in several small towns in the Northeast. They had returned to New Orleans just five months ago, and since then, Papa had been working hard to build his medical practice. The warmest months were, um, are, are when diseases spread most quickly, her father reminded her, so I'll be even busier with patients. I'm sure that Mrs. Curtis does not want a baby to take care of either, even with Annie's help. Marie Grace bit her lip. In all the excitement, she had forgotten to tell her father that Annie had quit. She quickly gave him the bad news. Papa sighed and he said he would have to hire someone else to help with the housework. Marie Grace looked at, up at him, but the baby can stay for a while, can't he? A short while, her father said. I'll put a notice about the baby in the newspaper. If his mother doesn't come to claim him, we'll take him to an orphanage where the nuns will care for him. If they, could, if they could not keep the baby at home, then an orphanage would be the next best choice, Marie Grace decided. There was, there was one across the street from her school, and she could visit him there. It will be almost like having a little brother again, she thought with a surge of happiness. And someday, I'll tell him how I found him in the rain and brought him into the house myself. Her father's voice broke into her thoughts. While the baby is here, there will be more work for everyone, he warned. He looked at her over the top of his wire-rimmed glasses. You will help, Mrs. Curtis? For a moment, Marie Grace thought of the new girl at school, but playing with Isabel could wait. I'll come right home every day, she said. Good, said Papa, and he began to gather up the towels. Marie Grace leaned over the sleeping baby. Don't worry, she whispered to him. I'll take care of you, I promise. And that is the end of chapter one. And next time we will read chapter two.